A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and Judah. In those days and that time, I will raise up for David a just root shoot. He shall do what is right and just in the land. In those days, Judah shall be safe, and Jerusalem shall dwell secure. This is what they shall call her, the Lord our justice. Verum Domini. from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we have for you, so as to strengthen your hearts, to be blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. Amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, we earnestly ask and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you should conduct yourselves to please God, and as you are conducting yourselves, you do so even more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verum Domini.
and grant us your salvation. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Gloria in et Domine. Jesus said to his disciples, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth nations will be in dismay, perplexed by the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will die of fright, in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. Beware that your hearts do not become drowsy from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life. And that day catch you by surprise like a trap. For that day will assault everyone who lives on the face of the earth. Be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent and to stand before the Son of Man. Verbum Domini. Los Today in our liturgy, we begin the Advent season. This is the first Sunday of Advent. We will bless the, our Advent wreath at the end of the intercessions and light the candle. And we begin our four weeks of preparation for Christmas, the coming of our Savior, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Catechism on Advent says that the church makes present this ancient expectancy of the Messiah for by sharing in the long preparation for the Savior's first coming, the faithful renew their ardent desire for his second coming. So we have these two, the first half of Advent, we have these readings about uh, the second coming, and then we get more about the, the, you know, the immediate preparation for his coming. We have the readings of the infancy narratives and things. And like we hear today, we see the, the gospel is about his second coming. And Jesus is telling us, he gives pretty long teachings in his gospels about his second coming and how we are to be prepared. And he says, when these signs begin to happen, stand erect, raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. All right, so the liturgy is presenting these events of salvation to us for us to enter in by faith. And that, you know, reliving, so to speak, or entering into that ancient expectancy renews in us this longing for his second coming, that our redemption is at hand. If we look at the first reading today, we see the prophet Jeremiah is prophesying during the time of the Babylonian captivity, over 500 years before Christ. He is still in Jerusalem, the ruins of Jerusalem. The population has been carried off into captivity, and he's making these prophecies about this coming fulfillment. I will raise up for David a just shoot. He shall do what is right and just in the land. In those days, Judah shall be safe and Jerusalem shall dwell secure. The Lord will lead his people back, but a, a deeper fulfillment is that, you know, the kingship, there's no more kings right after this Babylonian captivity, and that Jesus in the line of David fulfills these kings that have been given to Israel and Judah, and Jesus' fulfillment of that in his kingdom will have no end. It will be an everlasting, eternal kingdom. There will be no more captivities, right? We'll have the fullness of life given to us, fullness of peace and joy. So there's the Old Testament is 
permeated, is characterized by this hope of fulfillment. And we today live in a hope of fulfillment with his second coming, that our redemption is hand. This completion of what Jesus inaugurated on earth in his kingdom will be fulfilled in his second coming. And this father, he'll be hand over this world, his kingdom to his heavenly father, right? All purified uh, by his glory, transfigured, lit up in his second coming uh, in, in glory. In Advent, we also hear a lot about John the Baptist, his birth and martyrdom. And the church is called to take up his desire. Remember, he tells us to, that he must increase and I must decrease, that the Messiah must increase in our lives. Our focus must be on God, ourselves, our selfishness, our self-centeredness. The I, the ego, must decrease. And I must be about the Lord. So that is one of the great themes of Advent, right? This focusing on the Lord. It means that God and his kingdom gets bigger in our lives. It's the focus. It's our motivation. It's living in the realization that God is near, that he is at work, that his kingdom is underway, right? It's begun, inaugurated in his paschal mystery, is lifting up on the cross and has a coming consummation, a coming fulfillment when Jesus comes again to offer this world to his Father. He is with us now, right? God is drawn near to us in Jesus Christ, present to us in an extraordinary way in his sacraments, in the liturgy of the church. And he is at work, right? God is always at work, right? He created us, he redeemed us, he is at work in our sanctification, right? He holds us uh, in existence at all moments. You know, it's part of his creative work. His redemption is constantly uh, before us in the liturgy, the fruits and graces of that work on Calvary and his resurrection is continuously poured upon us uh, through the sacraments and through the liturgy. The sanctification, he gives us that Holy Spirit. He's always calling us to a deeper union with him, to uh, a greater life of holiness. And of course, he's coming again in glory when we will Stand before the judgment seat of our Lord, before him who is truth itself. And the truth of our relationship with God and others will be laid bare, right, at that general resurrection and that general judgment. You know, we have to, I think at this time too, it's the church asks us to examine our conscience. And we can look at the second reading today you know, the first, the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, you know, he exhorts the people to increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Strengthen your hearts to be blameless in holiness, right? So examine our lives and our relationship with others. You know, are we loving to one another? Are we forgiving? Are we reaching out to, one, to our brothers and sisters? Are we seeking holiness? And St. Paul exhorts us uh, that you should conduct yourselves, you know, to please God in a manner pleasing to God, right? To constantly uh, be converted and to look at our life, to look at our conduct and to, to see, you know, how we are with the Lord and our relationship with him. So the second coming will reveal the furthest consequence of our actions, right? We will see the effects of everything that we do, that we will know the meaning of the whole work of creation and the entire economy of salvation. We will understand the ways of his providence, you know, by which God leads everything to his final end, right? It's so mysterious to us now how God's working, how his providence is working in our lives, how he draws good out of evil that happens. And this reminds us, you know, we I think we often forget this in the chaotic world that's so present to us through our news media and stuff. It reminds us that God is in control, right? We are not living in some chaotic world, that God is sovereign. He either permits it or he ordains this to happen and he's using everything for his good and holy purposes. He is guiding creation to this 
coming fulfillment, which the world will be offered to his heavenly Father. And that's our end, that's our final end, that's the goal. The question I think the readings present to us today in the gospel, and all the readings really, is have we grown drowsy, right? That's the phrase that Jesus uses today. You know, beware that your hearts do not become drowsy from carousing, carousing and drunkenness. You know, having a whatever attitude. You know, have we kind of given up? Have our hearts grown drowsy? Literally, this means that, if we translate it, literally means your hearts have been weighed down. It's the same phrase used to describe Pharaoh's heart in the book of Exodus. Remember, we're told that his heart is hardened and he's not going to let the people go, right? He's going to hold them in slavery and bondage. This hardening of the heart <clears throat> in wickedness and, you know, due to our sins and impenitence, impenitence, that's what hardens our heart. This refusal to repent of the evil we have done, you know, our steadfastness and our, and our wickedness and our sins and our heart is weighed down, grows heavy. Pharaoh would not let the people go. The people were ready to go, right? Ready to do God's will, to seek him, to live in freedom, to live in communion with the Lord. And Pharaoh is holding them, right? It's a powerful image of the grip that sin has on us and the grip that our own willingness, our own lack of willingness to convert can have on us. So we look at our lives and say, have we been hardened in our sin? Have we given up the fight against sin, right? We are called as Christians to be converted every day, right? To examine our lives every day, to renew this longing for the Lord. I heard a phrase recently that struck me and it said, you know, that dead things float downstream, right? Downstream in our culture, right, has a very definite meaning, right? Our culture is pulling us one way away from the Lord. And if we're alive, if we're being converted, if we're new, renewed in our longing, seeking of the Lord, we're not simply going to float downstream. We're going to be alive with his grace, alive with the spirit of char charity. I remember one time <clears throat> I was up at the shrine, and they have a beautiful river that surrounds the, the, the land that the shrine is on. And they have these uh, big rainstorms, and the, that river swells up really quickly. It becomes like a flood. And I went down there one time to see the, the swollen river. And I remember I was just watching it. And this whole tree with leaves and everything comes floating down the river. And it was totally uprooted, right? And dragged along by the river, right? And it struck me, you know, that's an image. We can become uprooted and carried away. Are we rooted in Christ? Are our roots clinging, you know, to the soil and, and being, you know, being grounded in the Lord, like the bush that grows near a running stream. We hear about that image in Scripture a lot. You know, being rooted in Christ, rooted to his Holy Spirit and in staying strong. You know, this call uh, not to become drowsy means that we are to be vigilant at all times, to be spiritually recollected. Are we distracted with a superficial life. I kind of made that point yesterday briefly, but that's a great temptation for us today, to lead a superficial life. There's many distractions that we have, and we're called to live a sober life, right? Not, you know, carousing and drunkenness and caught up in the daily anxieties of life, but to be intent on the Lord, to be listening to his word, pondering his word, always aware of God's closeness to us. I think that's at the heart of recollection, aware that God is close to us, that he is present in our lives. Are we distracted? Are we living in our virtual media world? You know, we can spend so much time before the screen, the screen time, so to speak, and live in just this virtual reality. You know, the internet, the computer, provides so many uh, distractions, uh, the TV, the phones, the iPods. We can be caught up in our celebrity culture, caught up in that fascination and just live in this world that doesn't even exist. You know, that's not even uh, 
in contact with reality, constantly surrounded by the unreal at all times. You know, it's when the means of relaxation become an end in themselves and become dissipation. We're not recreating, being renewed to go back and, and do our work or to participate in community life or family life in a, in a, in a new way. That's proper relaxation, a balanced relaxation. But we're dissipated, right? We come back drained and bewildered, right? Because we've lived in this escapism, right? So we have to check our own hearts on that. And I think it's, you know, it's not a simple black and white standard we can have. I think we know our hearts and what is proper rest and restoration and what's dissipation. Our hearts, you know, become restless when we're not being fed and when we're in this world of escapism. We become weighed down. In Advent, I've come to appreciate more and more, is about tearing our hearts from these attachments and the kingdom of this world and placing our hearts on the kingdom of God, right? Seeking his will, working to further his kingdom realizing that petition in the Our Father that we pray every day, thy kingdom come. Are we about the coming of that kingdom? Are we faithful to our vocation, to our state of life? Uh, are we looking at our relationship with our brothers and sisters? Are we loving them, being converted every day in our relationship towards them? Or are we living in the world of attachments? Or are we living in the world where we, our spirits are truly fed? John Paul II said this idea of being converted every day, that prayer is the first and last condition for conversion. For it's this condition for spiritual progress and holiness. That prayer enables us to be converted continually. It helps us to believe, to hope, and to love, even when our, our human weakness hinders us, right? So prayer, contacts us with, you know, puts us in contact with this grace that renews us. That's the first step, to be converted every day, to be vigilant in prayer. And in Advent, too, we have the great theme of Mary, that we imitate her receptive attitude, her attitude and life of prayer, that everything is received from the Lord, that we're in this contemplative stance to God, and we receive, right, and prayer contacts it puts us in contact with that grace. May this be a fruitful advent for us. May we be vigilant in prayer and watchful for the coming of the Lord.